A connection is the beginning of everything. Our roots are set on the ground, our senses in the wind, and our eyes on the sun. At Green Vault, we dream of a green world, a clean world, a world that is alive and grows with us, flows with us. We work every day to create reliable, affordable, and sustainable renewable energy for the planet, families, and business. We do this by using only residual biomass and developing wind and solar production projects around the world. We are part of nature, and together we fight climate crisis and build a more sustainable future for you, for everyone. We are connected by nature and for the nature. We are Green Vault, shaped by nature, powering its future. So, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, what I would uh, intend to do during these minutes was ba would be basically two things. From one side, to give you some thoughts about uh, the climate change, but more important than that, explain how uh, does Green Vault, which, as you may know, is a listed company with a market cap of about 1.1 billion. Uh, but uh, as I was saying, explaining how uh, Green Vault is tackling the, the, the problem. What I try to show is that innovation is not necessarily scientific innovation. Innovation can be and must be very often utilizing the available commercial practice in terms of changing the business model. So, um, first point, uh, as you know, the energetic transition, energy transition is a must. It's a must because we must decarbonize. It's a must because we must reduce the, the level of waste. It's a must because we must recycle. In this context, of course, renewable energies are uh, very, very important. Very important because of the impact in the environmental. It was already very important because they are cheap and they were already one year ago or two years ago, the cheapest way of generating power and recently with the um, dramatic situation in Europe is also important because they reduce the external dependence. So it's obvious that renewable energies are crucial in terms of the transition of energy. The question that we may ask is if it's so obvious in terms of economic, in terms of competition, in terms of environmental, why don't we have more renewables? And the European Commission in the um, paper that they disclosed this year was very clear on that. The problem of not having enough renewables has nothing to do with money. Money is available. The problem is, has a name which is permitting. It's difficult to permit uh, renewables. It's difficult because of uh, bureaucratic reasons sometimes, which can be solved. But it's also difficult when we speak about big projects because there are conflicts. Let's see, I spoke in the beginning, decarbonization is a must, but it's not the only thing. Biodiversity must be also met. Um, the demographic elements must be met. And what we know, and if you are, let's see, if you are very cold and uh, uh, intelligent in looking at the problem, you can see that very often uh, renewable plants uh, has negative impacts in other important things. Example, if you want to make a, um, a solar farm in agriculture zones, you have conflict with biodiversity in terms with the equilibrium of the population. If you want to build a wind farm near a city, you have problems because of noise, because of uh, visual pollution. So the first conclusion that European uh, Commission draw, which for us is not, was not new, but it's stated very clear that renewables don't grow more because there is a problem of permitting, and permitting has to do with bureaucracy, but not only. Second thing that is new in terms of the way we approach renewables is the following. If it's difficult to build very big uh, solar or wind uh, installations uh, because of the other um, collateral impacts, if you think about using what is already humanized to generate power, speaking the more directly, if you use the, the rooftops, if you use the, 
the car parks <coughs> to generate power, everybody's in favor. So one way of um, overcoming the difficulty which is permitting is developing the renewables in the areas which are more friendly for everybody. So having this in mind, these structural needs of the carbonization, the recycling, uh, reduce of the waste, and where the difficulties are, the business model of um, Green Vault, which as state is a, a not big company, but a, a, mid -cap, a small mid-cap in the, in the Portuguese and European market, was to address and innovate the business model, focusing ourselves in three business areas very specific. First business area is biomass, only residues. Uh, we are totally, uh, we think that uh, using dedicated forests to, to generate power is a nonsense. What we use is only residues. Either forestry residues, like the case, or agricultural residues, like in Portugal, or uh, urban, uh, wooden um, urban residues, like in UK, the two countries where we are. Being like that and, uh, and, um, and, and um, being totally compatible with the new directive that is being discussed at the European level, we think we are creating value because if we, we did not use this biomass, these residues, to generate power, what would be the alternative? The alternative would be other landfills or uh, let, them, let this fuel in the forest increasing the risks of the, um, of the summer fires that we know very well in Portugal or Spain. So this is the first area. This is an area which we have strong tradition, more than 20 years. And with our knowledge, we decided last year to, exp to expand abroad and we went to UK. So this is the first business area, which is totally compatible with the needs, structural needs of the transition. But let's recognize there is not a very big growth area. The very big growth area is wind and solar, namely utility scale. However, as I told before, um, the big problem is permitting. So, where are we uh, placed in what concerns the value chain? It's precisely in this first phase is permitting. What's permitting is obtaining environmental approvals, and agreed connection, agreement from the population, securing the land. So, we are speaking about an area which is not very much capital intensive, but it's very demanding in terms of, uh, of human resources. This is not lobbying, this is knowledge. If you have a project and this project does not fit because of environmental or grid connection, we must have the knowledge and the imagination to reframe the project and do it. Uh, you can ask why do you have advantage here? Because you, if you want to be in a certain place, you must have comparative advantage. We have why? Because when we made the IPO and we, we got listed last year, at the same time we, we, make a, we made a capital increase in kind under which we were able to acquire through a capital increase a major develop, strongly, particularly in Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, but also in the, in the Southern Europe, and also in Portland, Spain. The main basis is Poland. People had lots of, a very modern, uh, the management team with more than 200 years of experience, together of course, and so we have this knowledge. So uh, what is our innovation in this case? Our innovation is transform a, a, a business which normally is very much national, very much located, to transform it into a pan-European business based on, on knowledge that we are developing. So we have a pipeline of about 6.6 gigas. So I'm not going to uh, throw numbers over you. What is important is that Green Vault is in the area of the renewables in terms of utility scale in which the scarcity is. And this is very important. Again, I'm not inventing nothing. I'm using, understanding, trying to understand the market and anticipating. And the first business area is what, as I told you, permitting is go always going to be very difficult when we speak about um, permitting, uh, on, about utility scale. So where is the future? The future is more and more on the utility, on the decentralized generation, meaning using the rooftops, using the proximity concept. We are moving, in fact, from a situation in which we have a central generation which exports power to the consumers to a situation in which we have more and more decent, decentralized generation. Where are we? We are today in Portugal, Spain, 
uh, with the expectation of moving to other countries. Still a very fragmented market. Our knowledge, again, knowledge, competitive advantage is needed, relies on the fact that we always work with local partners, people who know the business, who know that they would like to grow more, that they cannot, but with a partner like ourselves, they can do it more. So we began with the self-consumption. Um, either in Spain we are with in, um, also in individuals in Portugal in corporate. So why are we in corporate? Because not having a, a strong network, it's easier to reach the, the market through, um, through the corporate side. And it's basically a, a key account manager relation. Again, it's an innovation of this. And so we are in this moment, I would say, and uh, we are, I, I don't say market leader, but why one of the leaders of the market, very clearly. And why? Because we give importance to this. We have the best people and we give importance to this. We began with the self-consumption, basically installing uh, panels and batteries and when it makes sense, and it makes a lot of sense more and more, using uh, also uh, electrical charging because the companies, when they go to um, self-consumption, they can um, also profit from that opportunity to also to install um, electrical charges. So we began with that. Um, today, just, but we understood that that was not enough. And we understood that from one side, the European law, the second directive, already accepts and, and in a certain way promotes the concept of energy communities and the Portuguese law is rather advanced on that. So we decided that on top of the pure self-consumption, individual self-consumption, we could move ahead and go to the um, energy communities or collective self-consumption as you want. And what does it mean on a very uh, clear um, view? If you have a very big roof top, a very big roof and very low consumption, example, a warehouse or a football stadium, very big surfaces, very small consumption. You can, if you only think about self-consumption, you install a very t tiny installation. If you think about selling the power also to your neighbors, you can have uh, what you call energy community and the rich use the full um, roof or car park, part of it for your consumption and the, and the balance to, to move to it. Uh, is, it, is it profitable? Of course it is. I don't believe in, in sustainable business if they are not profitable. The profitability is a precondition for any sustainable things. And this is um, already sustainable, it's, it's profitable. And we, namely, with the high prices of power that you have today, the pay, we are speaking about paybacks of two, and a, two years, two years and a half. Very, very quick paybacks uh, of, this, uh, of these investments. And so we are being uh, rather successful uh, today, just for you to have an idea. It, only in Portugal, we um, signed, not intentions, but we signed agreements for more than 100 megawatts, as I'm speaking, in Portugal. And our objective is continuing like that, um, not only uh, looking to other geographies, as I told you, but also deepening our activity, namely in Portugal and Spain. You see, the numbers are so obvious that sometimes I think I, I just surprised why we don't materialize more. 100 megawatts is good, but if the number of proposals under discussion are very, very big. And, the, and here again, it's not a question of money. It's a question from one side of mentality, a bill to the side, and on the other side, will to discuss. So this is what I would like to share with you. I try to be brief and not to overload you with, with numbers and figures. That you can, oh, we publish everything in our site and in CMDM site, so you can have everything. But my point here is the, is the following. To um, bring value added to energy transition, you don't need to invent the wheel. In fact, you should not invent the wheel. What you should is to understand where are the needs, where are the gaps, utilize the technology, te technology which is available, and, and do it. And again, innovation has to do a lot with innovating in terms of business model. So thank you very much. This is what I'd like to share with you. Thank you.
Thank you. And, and it's very clear from not just the, the words that, that you have delivered to us today, but also from some of the contributions from earlier, how fundamental it is that the, the, the process and business model innovation um, needs to evolve further in order to support this decentralization because decentralization means you're not just dealing with the problem once, you're dealing with the problem in multiple locations and therefore you're simply amplifying the number of times in which you've got to confront these processes and obstacles which may be planning. Um, permits, permits, permits. That's, that's a recurring theme and I'm sure we'll come back to that. Um, do we have questions? Everybody, I, I was just looking at your website and I noticed you're also doing, you talked about the markets you're addressing, you said UK, Spain, um, Romania. Yes. You're also, so, so you're really extending your reach all across the European region. We are. Um, and what's, how, what's the secret of that? If you want to be in this business model, as I told before, this is not a very high, a very hard area because we have chosen this area, which is the permitting. It's not, we don't intend to be a, a very big company. We don't have capital, nor skills, nor, nor uh, cost of capital for that. So we want to be on this uh, first segment. And what's the secret is human resources. That's why, and how can we be in Romania or how can we be in, um, in, in Poland or in Iceland? How? Having always local partners, people who understand, who, who share our business model and want to work with us. So trying to build a structure like this, counting on uh, sending people from Portugal, from Spain, or from Poland to, to everywhere does not work. You have to be able to work very closely with local people. This is something that uh, um, is, is crucial. Of course, uh, I just explained you about the business plan. The business plan, the business plan now what we are doing is these three pillars, but there are three enablers which are below that, which are very important. And one is what you raise. We have to be able to compatibilize this growth with three things. One, people, I just speak, so just spoken about, not only uh, good people in the, in the corporate center, but also local people, which we must attract and retain because attracting, not retaining, is the worst of the world. So um, people, you must meet and have money. Let's see, we cannot and we should not engage in commitments if you don't have uh, not only the capital but the liquidity to do it. And this is an obsession from our side. Before we, we think about anything, we must have the money of our, on our side. And one thing that I learned during my life is that the banks are excellent when you don't need the money, so you have to, uh, to borrow the money uh, up front. And the third one is organization. It's very important. We cannot, a company like ours, like ours if you are not very organized with strong systems, the probability of um, disruption is very big. Again, I'm not inventing an IT system. I must use the best available practice in the market. And, and this is where we try to innovate, putting the puzzle together. So in a sense, you're creating a decentralized organization that's highly locally focused acting in concert with partners but yes but also but always with a strong control financial uh, human resources policy and uh, organization right rather like the diagram we saw in the in, a, in the, one of the presentations earlier but 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 to that point then anyone who's here from another country um you would be interested in talking to them about um how you can deploy infrastructure in mm -hmm. in, in any environment okay do we have a question yes two questions uh yeah, since Greenwald seems to be, uh, sorry, stand up. Seems to be uh, very strong in the biomass market, uh, I have a question because the future of biomass might be a bit of a challenge for, for people using it. I come from Slovenia, which is number three in Europe for, for forestation. And, uh, you know, I was told that, yeah, we, we're trying to move from high quality bi biomass to low quality, as you said, yeah? We, we should not pick up the best products uh, to, to burn. But then you come to the end of the chain and then the biodiversity asks you to leave this low quality biomass in the forest for the birds to use it for... And the invertebrates to shelter. Whatever, in yeah, yeah. So uh, what is then the future? So where should we position biomass in the future? Okay, so uh, first question is, uh, you should use low quality 
I would say that the European Union recognizes what is obvious, that burning uh, um, wood, which should, could be used for furniture, for, um, for, paper, for paper, for high value area, areas to burn, to generate power, is a nonsense. And so, namely when we import them from the US or from uh, Brazil, it does not make sense. So you should use low quality biomass. You say, well, but the biomass should be stay, should be kept in the forest. Not obvious at all. Not obvious at all. If you want to be very specific, for instance, um, eucalyptus uh, uh, plants. If you uh, don't, let's see, the first generation of eucalyptus, you cut them. The first generation should be kept there because it, it grows. The second, the same. The third, you should not because otherwise we would. Uh, um, um, damage the following ones. And, and other examples, for instance, very often, if you live, if you being Portuguese or Spanish, for make you better to understand, if you leave the, the roots, if you leave the branches within the, the forest, what you are having to have is not birds. What you're going to have is fires. To be very clear, I'm not. And you see, if you were Portuguese, you would understand that five years ago, 60 people were killed in fire. So it's not. Uh, so I would say that, the, and there are many biomass of low quality which is not used. Give you an example. Uh, here in Portugal, Spain, you have lots of vine vineyards. Every year, they have to be cut. Do you know what we, what people do with that? They burn it. They burn it. And, and you see, this is lots of things that are not utilized. So I would say, in this moment, for instance, today, traditionally in Portugal, we had 100% of biomass um, um, from the forests. Today, the, the share of agriculture is already about 10%. You see, if you look at the gardens, gardens, if you are in the city, what do you think the, the when, and sometime, from time to time, you see piles of uh, uh, green field things, in the, in the streets. What do you think they do with this? Landfills. Is it, isn't it better to generate power? It is, obvious. So have plenty of things of that. Having said that, as I told before, the big growth is not here. You see, on the other hand, I did not give an example in UK. UK you have wooden, wood from the demolitions. Have nothing to do with birds. If you don't utilize that for, bio, or for power, what you do it? Landfills, which okay. in, in England are forbidden. This is clearly a very broad topic and, and lots of potential sources of reusing wood without disrupting the um, ecosystem, as, as, as you suggested. There is a question, or well, there was a question just behind you. you. You've kind of partially answered my, um, my question, but I was just sort of thinking about sort of different energy solutions for different kinds of areas. Just what sorts of areas geographically, um, whether urban, rural, or distributions of populations, or is it best placed for? And, and where is it a complete non-starter? You're speaking about decentralized or? Yeah, decentralized. Let's see, the obvious cases, you have two areas. Uh, the obvious cases where the payback is quicker is namely industrial areas. Industrial areas in which the companies uh, have uh, rooftops uh, big. And what happens very often is that sometimes if you think about an industrial um, Park, we have several um, installations S with different uh, generation cycles, and so this is an obvious case in which we can combine them in a community. This is something which is obvious. Another thing which is obvious are the um, um, installa uh, installations in, in um, schools in the middle of the city. This is another area, very obvious, in which they have more consumption than that. A third area where it is very obvious is namely the rural areas in which uh, uh, normally um, there are uh, plenty of uh, underutilized uh, in installations and, uh, and which we could practically self-consumption, self generate a total self-consumption. What we are seeing here in Portugal is that uh, for the moment, as I told, the law is good. We have a good law. However, the public sector is a bit, not a bit, it's delayed. I would say that in Portugal and in other countries, when the public sector, either central or local, um, understands 
that they must do it, I would say that will be an exposure. So here, in fact, um, uh, if I think what a country, the potential of the countries in terms of decentralized is huge, what we must be prepared is to tackle with certain uh, lack of uh, manpower to do it. And this is something that uh, can be important. And I think that, um, and this is another vector, uh, another thing that to think about, that uh, international labor mobility in terms of bringing people to do this kind of mid-sized uh, skilled uh, work is something which is important. I would say that if I think about the possible bottleneck, for a big expansion is manpower. 